<laughs> Hello, everybody. Sorry, I was chatting with Scott Melker, and I think let me just check, make sure the audio is. I was yes uh, about stuff and how no matter how much data you present to people, they're still blind, and I I don't know what causes that block. But anyway, we're gonna look at about forty five big nuggets of data here today. Thank you all for joining. It's Tuesday. It's Okta. It's summertime. Pancake Panda's here. Zeno's here. Tesla's here. Everybody's here. So I want to thank you all for coming. Let's jump in. This is what I call the silence before the stampede. And I'll explain why things are happening behind the scenes, which people are thinking, oh my God, everything's dead. Nothing's happening. But yes, <laughs> history will repeat. And it'll be an exciting time ahead. So let's jump into all of the goodness. Um, <clears throat> and this is... That silence before the stampede. And again, crypto has been in that state of kind of crypto sleep, crypto slumber, I think I called last week's video. Low trading volumes, historic low volatility. But typically, this is the interesting thing. It is often followed by a violent wake up and a big spike in volatility and a whole bunch more. And there's a lot of stuff that could trigger that. You know, we know about BlackRock. We know about ETF decisions. We know about the SEC. We know about Grayscale versus the SEC. We know about structural pressure from derivatives. We know there's so much going on. And there's people stacking behind the scenes. We'll talk about those folks too. So as usual, this is edutainment, not financial advice. And probably most important, people kind of ask me, so what do you mean by amplify your intelligence? Well, there are two steps you can take uh, to amplify your intelligence, make yourself more well-rounded, etc. Subscribe to this channel. This will give you access to a wealth of information literally that you cannot find anywhere and help you stay ahead of the curve in this AI revolution. You want to be on the right side of it. Also, watch the videos that cover all aspects of financial freedom and it'll help you shape your future and position yourself to be successful. That's why I do this. If nobody's listening to me, I wouldn't do it, but you're there. So it's for you. Now we're going to start with the good news as usual uh, for people who are new to the channel, if there are any out there. We start with the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever has the most news, we start with first and then go down the line. Today, a lot of good news. So first of all, let's look at um, the market over the last week. And this is the market, crypto market divided by Bitcoin. So you can see last week, Ethereum underperformed Bitcoin, but only slightly. But there was quite a bit of green. In fact, two dark green spots. You've got Uniswap and Shiba. I'll talk a bit about Uniswap later. Uh, Binance, Solana, Doge, Litecoin, Cardano, etc. All beat Bitcoin. Kind of interesting. But isn't it supposed to be a time where Bitcoin dominance is going to go up? No. In fact, Bitcoin dominance is quite low. It's still at that 47.63% level. Notice that ETH down just by a fraction. XRP down just by a fraction for the week. But the rest of the stuff is pretty much up. So again... Quiet week, very low volatility, not a lot happening, but there are things happening behind the scenes you just don't notice yet. Now, last week I did talk about the fear and greed, and I said we're probably going to bounce off 50. It was 50 last week, and we did. Here we are, up to 53 again. Not much of a bounce, but I didn't see it breaking below 50 because there is so much bullish sentiment out there. There's no need to be fearful. Also, with low volatility, there's no need to even wear a seatbelt. It's kind of steady. So let's talk about flows by assets. Follow the money first. Now, investors have been favoring altcoins. So the data I just showed is now backed up by this great information from CoinShares. And you can see here the inflows last week totaling not much, only about $3 million. But for the last eight weeks, we saw inflows in totaling about $19 million. Uh, Cardano, Solana, XRP saw the largest inflows totaling 600000 640,000 and half a million dollars, respectively. But Ethereum and Avalanche saw outflows totaling 2 million and about 400,000, respectively. So, not all good, mixed. And we'll talk a bit about how different players and analysts view the top altcoins for this bull run. Interesting slide later. And I'm kind of aligned with some of it, too. Let's look at the Bitcoin spot volume. We are now below. January 2021 levels, ladies and gentlemen. This is crazy to see. Nobody's buying. Or is somebody buying, but they're doing an OTC, so you don't see it here. 
We'll find out in a minute. Uh, let's look at volatility. This is from the block into the block. And you'll see here as well, Bitcoin volatility is at 2020 levels. You can't make this up. Coach Casey, thank you for coming. That is insane. So, and this is a 30 day average and for us to be this unvolatile, it's like as the joke goes around now that Bitcoin is trading like a stable coin, like pegged to one, it's just not going up or down or anything else. But this is the one I want to talk about today. And this is why I called it kind of calm before the storm, silence before whatever, calm before the rampage, whatever you can call it. I was playing with different titles, who knows if they any of them make any sense, but Bitcoin is in that period of extremely low volatility. And to you all out there, it may seem boring, you may lose interest, you may go off and do something else, play golf, take a vacation, etc. But I want to explain, it's actually a very good thing. Low volatility is a sign of a bull market, believe it or not. And Bitcoin has a history of going on massive runs almost every single time after a period of low volatility. And in fact, Bitcoin's current level of volatility is the second lowest ever on record. The only time it was lower was back in 2017. And I guarantee you, half of you here in the audience weren't even in Bitcoin 2017. I nibbled my very first nibble in 2017. So I'm a latecomer too. But which was right, literally, last time this happened was right before the bull run started that took Bitcoin up to $20,000. We watched it especially going very quickly from 3K to 20K. So what does this mean for you? Well, it means it's a good time to be patient. Don't, uh, a lot of people recommend, don't try to trade Bitcoin in this environment. I trade Bitcoin proxies in this environment. It's kind of my thing. But just wait for the volatility to pick up and the price to start moving again. And when that happens, you'll be glad you waited. So some of the uh, low volatility leaderboard, you got December 2016, August 2023, which is right now, May 2016, April 2019, February 2013, and November 2020. And we all know what happens after all of those cases. The number goes up. So, fun times. Anyway, that is, of course, if history repeats, which it generally does, or rhymes at the very least. So let's look at another piece of new data. This is the number of new non-zero Bitcoin addresses. Well, over the last year, the number of Bitcoin wallets has increased by more than 5 million. And that's equivalent to the entire population of Costa Rica, Palestine, or Singapore buying Bitcoin in just 12 months. And this is a significant increase in adoption. And it suggests that Bitcoin is becoming more mainstream. We are still so early, like literally less than one and a half percent, less than two and a half percent, less than half percent, depending on how you analyze the wallets are in Bitcoin. It's probably closer to less than half of 1%. So if you're in it, you're lucky, you're early. Let's talk about the halving cycle, the countdown clock. We now have 259 days to go. And by the way, the speed at which every month goes by, wow, it's going to go fast. So that is fun. And now there is a sufficient level of knowledge in the space. People know this is not the time to sell before the pre-halving run. And that is why 78% of Bitcoin is held by long-term holders. They're holding. They've got their seatbelts on. They're going to wait because they know what's coming. And guess who else knows what's coming? <laughs> Mr. Sailor. Shout out to Michael Sailor, friend of the channel. He snags more. Um, and they just bought another 467 Bitcoin for 14.4 million. Not the biggest buy he's ever done. I think he just wanted to round up to 152,800. And they have their earnings call coming out. Uh, actually, it's going on live now or at the same time. So I hope I don't interrupt his call at all. But that is nice. And uh, for those of you who have the ARB cloud, that model is being updated as we speak. It'll be in your trading view within an hour or so. Next, uh, let's talk about the top three last week. Um, Binance is up. FUD be damned, as they say. Binance went up 1% last week, uh, hitting 241 bucks. Bitcoin down, but actually just before this was posted, Bitcoin went on a bit of a rampage. Literally, it shot up 500 bucks in minutes. So that's just how fast it goes. It was at 28.9, call it. Now it's like 29.3, and it's moving fast. And Ethereum, 18.28. And Ethereum, let's check on that, 18.50. Ethereum just shot up 30 bucks as well. 
they tend to follow each other. And that is where we are over the last week. Everything is a moving target, but to see that type of spike in volatility is nice to see. Remember, calm before the storm. Now let's look at the Bitcoin short-term holder cost basis. What's interesting about this, and I've been talking about this a lot lately, as we bounce off of it, the actual short-term holder cost basis is now 28,300. I was hoping we get close to it. We didn't, we got to about 287. So we missed it by about 400 bucks, but that is a good time, at least for me, to uh, layer in and grab some more. And now, will it be the third test of hitting that line? I think people are gonna probably front run it, unless something catastrophic happens in the markets, could bring it all down. Now let's look at altcoin season still for now, and this is on a monthly basis. And you can see we are 73, which is pretty impressive. And things are going well. In fact, as I showed you in the previous charts, the alts have been outperforming Bitcoin over the last week. Let's look at where they all rank right now. Uh, this is a Bitcoin versus top alts over the last month. And you can see we still have the, you know, some real laggards. It's, it's amazing to see Matic down there so low, considering it is so well adopted. Algorand as well. Well, we know about Algorand. We won't talk about those guys. But then to the green, the left, the performers that have beaten, of course, Bitcoin over the last month. You got Monero, XMR. I always get confused. XMR and XLM. XMR is Monero, I think. Litecoin, Chainlink, Solana, Leo, Tron. Don't know what WBT. Uniswap had a good run as well, up 24%. Uh, XRP. And there's Stellar, number four, etc. Maker and Bitcoin Cash has had that very, very strong last month or so, last two months, in fact. Now let's look at another view of where Bitcoin risk is actually going up. And this is for Swiss block. You can see the top chart is the Bitcoin risk and it's in the red, which means it's dangerous to touch. I don't quite agree with this metric because I don't see a lot of downside from where Bitcoin is right now. It'd be nice to see 25K again, but I think that's highly unlikely. I think 28.3 could act as a very strong support level. And then the altcoin signal, not risk, altcoin risk, but the altcoin signal is strong, beating out Bitcoin. So people are beginning to rotate into altcoins again. A bit premature for this stage of the market in the pre having run. But again, you'll see the big bifurcation between winners and losers in the altcoin area, particularly in L1s and L2s. And we'll talk about some of those in a minute as well. Let's look at uh, digital asset funds. Here you can see 93% of the outflows uh, were from long Bitcoin investments while short Bitcoin. So it's 14th consecutive week of outflows. Despite that, short Bitcoin did pump earlier today. So people are getting nervous and putting in positions, which is weird because then after, right after they did that, Bitcoin shot up. So it wasn't a good trade for them. Anyway, let's look at one of our IA engine charts. This is the fully digital market cap divided by daily transactions. What you want here is a low number, ladies and gentlemen. You don't want a big number, but the most expensive amount of capital market cap per daily transaction is Ethereum, $225,902. Number two slot is Cardano, $208,849. Number three is Cosmos, 177,278. Um, then at the bottom, you'll see the winner on this metric is Solana, only $882 per transaction. But I want to highlight one player that's really coming in fast, and that is Sui, $2,752 bucks per transaction. And of course, Matic is there too. These are the ones that are kind of relatively good value considering the amount of transactions. So what's going on with Sui? Well, let's look. The SUI is driven by a game that they have, which has gone really viral. And literally 95% of all of the transactions, all of the users are playing this one game on this chain. So there's a couple of things that are interesting to note about this. You can see here, uh, as of yesterday, the SUI number of daily active users was 460,000, which is more than 10 times the number of Cardano daily active users. And you got Polygon, 445, Ethereum, 365,000. And number four slot is 282,000 for Solana. But that SUI thing has been quite incredible to watch. But it looks like the amount of transactions are coming off. And like everything else, 
and I'm not a gamer, but it seems like people get bored with games over time. But what is important to stress about this, this is the new world order, these new layer ones. It just takes one or two dApps, could drive a ton of adoption, drive a ton of transactions, and people will just jump on the chain in a heartbeat. That's why it's so fickle. But it's also good to see how the chain actually performs under the stress and it is scaling very well. So hats off to Sui. Don't know if it'll last. Still a lot more work to do. But uh, again, impressive to see and impressive to monitor. And when you look at, like if you're an old layer one from years and years ago, and you see these new guys coming in and doing 10x, 12x, 15x, your daily active users out of nowhere, that would be quite alarming. Just an observation on data. That's all. Now, let's look at some other data where layer twos are spiking. These are two optimistic rollups. And look at the spike in transactions here. I was like, what? What's going on here? So we dug into that a little bit. And Optimism and Arbitrum are two EVM compatible optimistic rollups. By the way, uh, I did this face off series where I smashed together competing layer ones, layer twos, etc., and see how they perform, benchmark them against. 40 different metrics, and nobody really seems interested in those. So I don't know if it's because you're not interested in the tokens that I cover, or you're just not interested in all the data. I don't know. So I'm not going to do it tomorrow, unless, of course, you guys want a pair tomorrow below. Let me know. Uh, one that could be of interest is, say, Matic versus Arbitrum, for example. Who knows? But let me know if you guys are interested. If you're not, I'm not going to bother doing it because it's a lot of work. But Optimism has seen a huge increase in transaction activity, uh, while Arbitrum's transaction activity has been declining. And the recent increase in Optimism's transaction activity could be due to the launch of WorldCoin. And this, uh, despite the recent increase in Optimism's transaction activity, Arbitrum still leads in terms of total value locked. So once again, we're seeing different things shake out in the space. And the speed at which the space moves is fascinating. Sui, out of nowhere, literally a month ago, they had two and a half thousand users. Now they got nearly half a million daily users. And that is both exciting and stunning. So watch this space. Now, this is from K33 Research. Uh, they have a list they call the Winter Quality Index section, selection, where they just look at what they believe are the best cryptos out there. And there's one little change that happened. First of all, they've been pretty stable on this selection. And I update it pre pretty rarely. But Bitcoin is there. Ethereum is there. Dogecoin is in, of course, a little meme coin. Solana is in. Matic is in. Monero is in too, as well as Lido DAO. What they did remove, and the reason I'm showcasing this, is they took out Uniswap. Despite the fact that Uniswap had a great week, it was removed from this selection. The other one that's also in there is Cosmos at the bottom, which I did cover recently in one of my face-off videos. I think it was last Wednesday or the Wednesday before. I can't remember, but I just thought that is an interesting view of quality and the fact that there's only really one layer two on there, and that is Matic. That would be the one I would choose too, if I had to choose a layer two. Uh, Let's look at the stock market of the last seven days. You can see here Google and Meta have been on fire. Uh, Amazon up a little bit and Microsoft down 4%. What's interesting is Google kind of had really good earnings, especially on their Google Cloud platform, the GCP platform. And I think Microsoft is down because their Azure platform, which is like their version of GCP, is shrinking. So is Google killing them? Well, I do believe Google are kind of better at execution than Microsoft. Microsoft are good at buying stuff and trying to weave it into their sales and marketing outfit or whatever they do. I don't know. But uh, that was interesting to see where Azure was kind of an incumbent. And now you have Google trying to eat market share. They're not touching AWS since Amazon is still up, but uh, Microsoft is getting hit. So let's look at some other stuff. This is Bitcoin versus the QQQ, which is the top 100 NASDAQ stocks. And over the last 90 days, Bitcoin's up a measly 2%, basically. Hasn't done anything for 90 days. And the QQQ is up 21%. That's interesting to watch how not only the S&P 500, but also the tech-laden NASDAQ has actually been beating Bitcoin over the last 90 days a lot. 
Yeah. But we'll see if that rotation will change back sometime soon. In addition, for, this is a, an interesting little stat from Charlie Bellello too. The S&P 500 has gained 5%. It's gone up 5%. Since the Federal Reserve began raising interest rates in March 2022, they've been raising now for, what, 16, 17 months, and the stock market keeps going up. And this suggests, basically, investors are optimistic about the future of the economy, even as the Fed increases interest rates and tightens monetary policy. Most people still don't understand why this happens, but it's about the amount of money that's out there. There's too much money chasing too few good stocks. Therefore, the market will go up. In addition, I've been talking about this too. It used to be $4 trillion, but late last year it became $5 trillion of cash on the sidelines. Well, guess what? All the people sitting on all that cash, they can only sit on it for so, much, so long because they're getting paid to deploy it. And active managers are now increasingly bullish. They miss the train, but they're trying to chase it now. And their average exposure to equities is now at 102%. It's over the 100% mark. And it's a significant increase from October when the S&P 500 was over 1,000 points lower and their exposure was only 20%. They completely missed the train. Now they've suffered for the last nine months. And this suggests active managers are expecting the markets to continue to rise in the near future. And they missed a huge opportunity. So... Interesting. So that five trillion, you can expect that to deplete slowly as well over time. Speaking of another stock, Tesla and Tribes, it just shows you how you know uh, in the U.S. there are some strange laws. But in order to sell cars in certain states, you need to have a car dealership, huh? Some people call them dealerships, and this is according to the Associated Press. Uh, automaker Tesla opens showrooms in tr on tribal lands in order to avoid state laws, ramping up efforts to basically sell vehicles. And a lot of uh, parts of the US have, you know, Native American Indian lands where they can actually open casinos. And they, <laughs> Tesla were clever enough to find that little loophole. They could set up a store inside a casino and sling cars that way. And of course, people can gamble with their savings because the total cost of ownership of a Tesla is so low. I just thought that was interesting to share. But there's a bigger story behind it. First, let's look at breweries. Um, beer and U.S. breweries are taking off. It's like, what happened here? Like, since 1975, there were like, I don't know, 89. And now we have nearly 10,000 microbreweries in the United States. For all the beer drinkers out there, cheers to you all. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why this is happening. But one factor is the popularity of craft beer. And that is a beer made by a small independent brewery. It doesn't take a lot of money to set one up. Places like Colorado are full of them. And it's often more flavorful ingredients than mass-produced beer. And also there's been backlash against some traditional beers as well, which I won't go into. But it's also, also often sold on tap or at bottles and grocery stores. And another thing as well, there's a whole rise of the so-called beer geek culture. And beer geeks are people who are passionate about craft beer and they attend beer festivals, visit breweries, try new beers. They also make their own beers too and uh, are very knowledgeable in the area. So I thought for the beer lovers out there, that was interesting. Now, if you're short on time, all of this stuff is summarized in a podcast written by our community writers in a Substack form. All the slides, all the content, all the messages. So if you don't have time to listen to my 30 minute videos, my 20 minute videos, you can read this whole thing in five or eight minutes and get all the alpha you need. Now, bad news time. This is bad for our friends in the UK. I know there's a couple of you out there. I see you in, in the chat right now, but uh, this is from Bloomberg. And you can see UK prices, house prices are falling at the fastest pace since 2009. People expected that to happen in the US, but it hasn't because in the US, people have a lot of low mortgage rates locked down for 30 years. Therefore, people aren't selling their houses because it's too expensive. and They can't refinance at the 3% rate. So they're holding on. Hence, there's very little supply. Hence, the price is going up. It's a very interesting nuance. But in the UK, Britain's housing market correction has further to run. Many economists expect. And while the latest UK nationwide house price index was less bleak than expected, Borrowing costs are set to remain elevated, and that means an adjustment in house prices is likely to continue despite some resilience recently. 
And the same thing also is happening in Germany and other parts of Europe. So for those of you looking for your castle, have your sniper rifles, rifles ready, but also some more anecdotal evidence. Apparently, places in London, like apartments for rent, are still very much sought after. And many places get 100 applications for every listing that is out there. So it's just, you know, this is where this time is quite different in many ways. So let's talk about car dealerships for one second, because I did touch on that in the good news section. But this is interesting. And, and the reason I kind of mentioned this case is because we're seeing this is kind of the the decade of massive disruption. We have colliding S-curves hitting all the time, and it's going to result in the smashing of many, many traditional industries. One of them is car dealerships, and there's many more to come. In fact, uh, I read something where yesterday that TV anchors are being replaced with AI bots that can speak multiple languages. It's, I'll post on Patreon on that later. It's fascinating. But here, the average vehicle profits for franchise dealerships declined 25% in Q2 2022 compared to Q2 2021. And this decline was driven by a number of factors, including increased competition from direct to consumer. Electric vehicle companies, aka Tesla, also rising interest rates have made it more expensive cons for consumers to um, obviously finance their purchase, etc., People don't have as much money because 18 of the top 50 states are in recession, etc. But why are they dying? And are they all going to die? That's the big question. So if anybody out there has a stake in a car dealership, I'd suggest <laughs> be careful. But they are making less margins on cars. Service departments are decreasing their revenue because cars are more reliable. Uh, increasing interest rates are smashing their ability to do loans, which used to be a huge profit center for many of them. And literally high margins, taking more out of the pocket of customers is no longer there because they're interrupted by Tesla, uh, etc. There's a whole bunch of other problems happening too. Inventories are exploding and car dealerships are really, really, really suffering. So expect the number of people to work at car dealerships to go down. And it could also be a good time to snipe a deal if you do want to buy a traditional ICE vehicle because they have so much inventory and they just need to move it at all costs, even if it means selling at a 10% loss. So now the power is in your hands, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what's happening in Europe in that area, but also Tesla is killing car dealerships from Insider Magazine. They have eschewed the dealership model and EVs are changing the way we shop for cars. Also, there's demographic changes too. Younger shoppers don't have patience to go to a dealership and talk to a sales guy. They just want to do their research online and buy it directly. And this changes the whole car buying experience. And it will not be limited to EVs as well. So that whole intermediary thing is going away just like it did for insurance and many other industries. So again, this is the age of disruption. Prepare yourselves and position yourselves accordingly. Now, a little bit of ugly news. We'll start with our usual dumpage section, which people love. But there's a monster suey dump. A suey dump and I just talk about suey. 22.2 million coming your way that's dollars worth of tokens which is massive and then gal which is g-a-l-x-e i have no idea what it is but they're dumping 10 million i think they're ranked number 500 on the crypto list and then then we have aptos dumping 32 million i did talk about aptos and sui and arbitrum and stuff so be careful uh, when it rains down tokens it will bring about a lot of price suppression and uh, now let's talk about more rain, but this is upwards rain. You know, we are now government interest payments are surging, nearly hitting 1 trillion. Then it'll be 1.2 trillion, then 1.4 trillion, which will be twice the US defense fund, which is a massive over $700 billion. It's like all the money is now going into interest, but it's causing more problems too. We now in the US, and this is the same all over the world, places like the UK, etc., are having the same type of problems. We now have a crisis style budget deficit. Without the crisis, US currency is currently running a budget deficit equal to 8.3% of its GDP. Okay, that is a massive hole. 8.3% of over 20 trillion is huge. Now, this is the same level of deficit spending that the country saw during the global financial crisis in 2009 to bring the economy back. And that is when the government implemented a number of stimulus programs in an effort to mitigate the economic fallout. Now, this raises the question of what fiscal maneuvering room will the government have 
if the housing market continues to freeze, or if the sub 4% unemployment rate, which is currently at a record low, starts to rise, means less revenue, less tax income, etc. And many economists believe that the labor shortage will prevent the unemployment rate from rising, but others are not so sure. Now, if the unemployment rate does start to rise, I covered a lot of this as well in the Q&A on Sunday, the government will have less room to maneuver in terms of fiscal policy. This is because the government will need to use its limited resources to provide unemployment benefits and other forms of social assistance. So if you listen very carefully, you hear that noise? That's the money printer warming up. There will be a ton more money printing coming, and that is guaranteed. Ah, oh, craziness. Now, in inflation news, this is just a, such a joke. I always say the Fed can't control inflation. What they can do is destroy demand. And this proves it. Here you can see oil is set for the best month since January 2022. And we all know what happened in early 2022. We don't need to go back there. But oil prices again are surging and the shift is attributed to record-breaking demand for crude oil around the world. I covered that as well last week. And strategic supply reductions by OPEC plus and factors such as cutbacks from Saudi Arabia and Russia. In addition, speculation of the Fed is nearing the end of its money monetary tightening cycle have fostered an optimistic market sentiment, which means more demand, less supply, price will go up. Everything we do here is tied to supply and demand. Remember, when the price of oil goes up, so does inflation. But there are so many deflationary factors happening right now. They just, the government is looking at data that's year old, like owner's equivalent rent, etc., so maybe they'll bounce it, balance each other off because rents are tanking as we speak because nobody has any money. You either buy cars or rent expensive apartments. So everything is balancing out. We shall see. Anyway, with that, 45 slides. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to everybody on Patreon. Hit the like on the way out, everybody. And be safe. Be prepared. The future is changing. It is everything is being disrupted. Be on the right side of the disruption. I'm coming up with a big video around what that means for everybody as well. So stay tuned. It's a huge piece of work, but it's coming soon. Thank you all.